today we are it's the first Saturday of the month happy Saturday because we are dedicating to the I honor my parents campaign this time it's to empower the parents so they can be honored as well so it's empowering them so they can find strength to be respected to be to receive the reverence of their children and we entitled according to mentor joseph we entitled this educating beyond the words and we'll see why it's fascinating because we're seated here we don't know for how long we'll be incarnated nobody knows and we know the proposal of uh, reincarnation is to better ourselves, to improve ourselves. But how can we change ourselves so much if sometimes we doubt we have a physical machine that allows transformation? Because I look at myself in the mirror and I see it almost the same person every day almost because it's aging and I see the same person it's like am I changing inside how do I know like for example can we change so much like Paul in the book this year we're celebrating 70 years of this book can we change this much like Saul it was a radical transformation it took steps, when you read this book, it has 20 chapters. We're going to see that in part one, he talks about a very strong-headed person, very determined, very faithful to the Mosaic law, and then suddenly, it seems sudden, but then Emmanuel shows that he was being cracked in his belief every time something got wrong in his goals. He was being frustrated. He wanted something, he didn't get it. He wanted something else, he didn't get it. And he was being like broken to his knees. And then he surrendered and changed. So transformation requires surrender to the new. There is no way for us to change being the same. It's funny to say this because it's like our homes. I want a new home. I want a new house. But we don't want to change this chair. We don't want to change the podium. We don't want to change the screen. It's impossible to be new. We need to surrender everything saying, OK, it's like those programs you see on TV. People are like, they are hoarders. And the, the therapist comes and says, I'm going to help you. No, no, don't throw this away. Don't throw that away. <laughs> How do you want to help? be helped? You need to say, OK, I surrender. I let it go. He let it go. He surrendered. How? He was his age. He was not like a child. He was not a teenager. He was in his 30s, uh, young, but not that young for the time. A 30-year-old man at that time was like a 50-year-old man today in a rough comparison. They didn't live that much back then because life was rougher. So 30-year-old men, for a 30-year-old man to change that much, it requires a lot. What about Gandhi? Gandhi was a lawyer. He was married. He had children. He was living in an unequal system, oppressed by the British. He also transformed radically. He was an angry man. He had anger fists all the time. And he changed to a nonviolent man. Like how? We ask, 
Is it possible all these books in Spiritism, and not only in Spiritism, in other philosophies, they say, we are here to improve ourselves. We are here to change our lives. We are here to be better people. Question, question. How can we learn so much in one reincarnation? Do we have a physical machinery? Let's start from the physical. Do we have in our physical body the necessary tools for transformation? Because we look at ourselves in the mirror every day and it looks like the same. Can our bodies hold the capacity for transformation? Where is it? To understand how education happens, which is the acquisition of new habits, we need to have a physical body that accommodates transformation. Where is it? We need to know. It's beyond belief. It's about facts. Nowadays, thanks to neuroscience and spiritism as well, because spiritism is one of the unique whatever we call it, religion, philosophy, whatever it is that brings science and religion and philosophy all together and explain it all. It's beyond just philosophy. It accommodates science. And it tells us something that is really in the same directions as science. In this book that we studied at the Spirit Side of Baltimore, Evolution into Worlds, chapter nine, we learned something in 1958 that became, is becoming more well understood in science about the power of the brain. There lies the power of transformation. Science says the brain originates transformation. In spiritism, we see it that way, but it's powered by the mind of the spirit. Anyhow, it's almost the same because it says that the brain is moldable. It tells us, Andrea Louis says, the brain is the wonderful nest of the mind. It's like the nest, it's like the cradle where new life is being born every day. If I change my mind, I change my brain, I change everything else. Let us not forget that we have a spiritual brain in the perispirit. So if I change my mind, I change my spiritual brain. If I'm incarnated, I change my physical brain, I can change my life. We don't know how much transformational capacity we hold, but we do. Not only he says that, but science accommodates it by saying that the brain is built for change. It's fascinating that neuroscience now is investigating more and more how the brain holds the capacity for so much transformation beyond childhood. So much so that something that Andre Louis said in 1958, now, is being investigated by science. Andre Louis said in the book Evolution into Worlds that our neurons are born and renovated millions of times in the physical and extra physical planes. Probably a hundredth of it, not like half of it, but a little bit of it is already proved by science. And it was first proved in 2002. In 2002, for the first time, one of the leading scientists on this is Fred Gage at the University of California, San Diego. For the first time, he proved that the aging brain allows or accommodates the birth of new neurons conditioned to the fact that we expose ourselves to new situations. Just going from work to home and that routine, no. We need to expose ourselves to the new all the time. And this new may be reading these hundreds of spiritist books because 
Each one of them hold a world of possibilities. Or visiting homes of other people, nationalities, whatever it is, the new accommodates itself in new norms. We don't know how much, science doesn't know yet how much the norms can be renovated physically. Imagine extra physically. When he says extra physically, he's talking about the Paris Agreement. But it makes sense to us because if I, might, I, the spirit, change my mind, really, I change, I am supposed to change. When people come to us and say, oh, I'm glad to see you. After, I think Daniel said this like some time ago. People come to us and say, oh, I'm glad to see you. You haven't changed at all. That's good, keep, keep it this way. Um, that's not good. Of course, we should hold our virtues and stay like that, but we better change. Seeing people in 10 years saying, man, you changed. You're different. That's a sign that we are in the right track, if it's a better change, of course. It's beyond physical beauty. It's about the attitude. People come to us and say, you're different. You're transformed. Then we have a sign we're in the right track. But if we stay the same our whole lives, our families, um, whomever, friends, they see us and they're like, oh, you're the same old person. They like you, but same old person, a whole reincarnation? That's not good. Maybe it's good for them because each time we change, people feel the need to change as well. And sometimes they don't want to change, so we better not change, so they don't feel like they have to change. When we buy a new car, people are usually like, oh, I, maybe I should do the same. They have a baby, oh, maybe I should do the same. And the same for other changes, which is good that we are like this in society. But we need to change. It's like soap. Transformation is like soap. You cannot really hold it much because it slips from your hands. When we least see, boom, we're renewed and again and again and again. Chico Xavier himself. When we read books that talk about Chico Xavier in his almost 70 years of mediumship, we're going to see accounts of people who knew him at the beginning of his mediumistic abilities. He was afraid. He was hurt by the way people treated him. There was a day somebody came to him and said, did you know the priest at the mass, he said you should go to hell. And at the time, it was a very strong expression. People were very careful about using this. So he went home and he was distraught in his heart. He started crying and then his mom appeared and said, son, what's happening to you? Why are you crying? Mom, can you believe it? The priest sent me to hell. And with a sense of humor, she turned and said, but you don't have to go to hell. You better stay here, stay on earth. That's where you have to stay. You have a lot to do here. There was another time when he was still very young in his works. He was also distraught in his heart because somebody came to him and said, you're a beast, a beast, Chico Xavier, a beast. And he was like, he was a sensitive soul. He went home, he was like crying. And the mom appeared again and said, Chico, what's happening? Said, well, that guy, he, called me names and he said I'm a beast I'm not a beast well it's good you should be honored he called you a beast mom how come I'm not a beast well beast is a good animal because it works a lot and helps people out by holding a lot of load and carrying to other places so keep yourself as a beast better than that, a spiritist beast. So at the end of his life, 
we see a different man. A man that was not easily hurt. A man that was stronger, much wiser, less immature. Chico Xavier himself. He didn't need to go to Harvard to get a degree to be as wise as he was. He didn't need to work for a company like Microsoft to be who he was. But he was helping people so much, as much as they wanted to be helped. And his brain probably, very likely, got a hold of the much transformation he went through in that life. He made mistakes, but he tried to fix them. He had sometimes problems with resentment, like majority of people on Earth, but he learned with the man as a result. It's very likely that that transformation was really creating a whole new system in his physical body. And we know the physical body is not static as we think. It's very dynamic. It's as much energy as the spiritual body. And it's dynamic, it's changing, it's transforming, especially the brain. And our brains, science already tells, they hold the capacity of being very plastic. We need to learn about this because this is one of the frontiers of neuroscience. And it's one of the things that happens to us we need to know. No matter if we are 90 years old or nine, our brains hold the capacity for this transformation because science says it is a plastic organ. What is a plastic organ? Plastic in the sense that it's moldable. It's like clay. It's possible to change. It's built for change, our brains. So next time we look at the, ourselves in the mirror, probably we should look at ourselves picturing our brains and see how much transformation is happening in there. And this plasticity, scientists say, and this was mostly summarized by this renowned scientist, Merzinek. And you can watch some of these talks that will summarize to majority of the lay public in the, um, we would recommend, the TED Talks, TED Talks, TED Talks, if you Google it. You see how many people who are great minds and scientists go there and give these talks, especially about the brain. It's important to know about the capacity of our brains to transform ourselves. And there are two main errors that really are critical for transformation. First, the infancy. It's very critical. And science goes hand in hand now with the Spirit's Book. The Spirit's Book brings in 1857, way before science knew of it, that the first seven years of life are critical. And then science proves it. And I'm always, uh, uh, this is just a parenthesis, I'm always astounded when people say, oh, I'm not sure about spiritism, but we have many proofs that whatever spiritism reveals is ahead of what science finds out and proves. So it's much easier to go this way, learn it, and then understand science than the other way around. Because they reveal things that science still have not proved yet, and likely will in the very near future, if not in a farther future. But when we are young, the brain is setting up. What happens? We are born with thousands of possibilities, let's say. These are the neurons here. When we showed that picture before, let's go here. These are neurons, OK? This is a slice of the cortex. It was, of course, stained with fluorescence. So of course, they don't look like yellow. Say, oh, I have a yellow. <laughs> it's, it's very relative. But in this case, it was stained. So we could see in the fluorescent microscope. So here we have the cortex, and uh, these are cell bodies. And then here we have the, the neurons in fluorescent yellow and green that were newborn neurons. The condition is to raise new neurons, new connections, 
we need to expose ourselves to the new. If we do a new something every day, our brain's being boosted to something else. So when we talk about child, the difference between the child brain and our brain, besides many other elements, is that the children are born with thousands of possibilities. Like this, let's say they have this and this, they are connected synaptically. That's what we call the synapses, connected. If you expose this child to music, this is just symbolic. Let's say this connection here is about the music pathway. It's gonna stay there. It's telling the brain, stay there. We need you to process music. We're symbolically explaining this because there are trillions of neurons there. Let's say this other one is about eating healthy. It's telling the brain, stay there because we need you and everything else. If this one is about, we're just symbolically saying, about crimes, no exposure to crimes, what happens? To keep the balance of the brain and the body, it prunes. The connection disappears. It needs that energy for something that you're using. That's why we need to be very careful about what we're exposing our children to. Because all they need to set up the brain is exposure. You don't need, like, you know how children are. You don't even mean to teach them something they already learned it. They heard you talking in the kitchen, they were in the living room. How come you learned it? The brain is wired to expose itself to environment. Whatever we do, we expose them to that, boom, the connection stays. All we need to do is exposure. That's the responsibility of parents. TV, very harmful if we don't select very well what it is. Because we're telling the brain, stay their connections, and later on, they are going to have that connection for things that probably are not very good. It's like giving them tools, like giving them a gun, invisible gun, and saying, don't use a gun, but here's the gun. And then later on, when they need it, you're going to use a gun. So this is the critical part, besides many other elements in infancy. But then in adulthood, which is our case, what happens is that plasticity still exists. We still change. But there, plasticity will be used to refine the setup in the brain, to refine it. It's a a little, it takes a little bit more steps, more than simple exposure, probably a longer exposure. Science still trying to understand what it takes, but the brain's plastic, and it must be. For a man like Paul to change so much in his 30s, so I cannot look at myself in the mirror anymore and say, I cannot change. Based on spiritism and current science, if I say I cannot change, it really means I don't want to change. Because we hold in the brain the power of our transformation. Especially in the human parts that are more related to the frontal part of our brains, the prefrontal cortex. Discernment can really boost a cascade of events. And why we're saying this? Because when we talk about educating ourselves and educating our children, we're talking about working with the elements that we have. So we don't need to make effort to change in the sense of the brain holds the power that we need. We need to expose ourselves to the new to transform ourselves. The brain already holds the capacity to transform, to transformation, if the mind changes. Same for our children. But we're gonna learn today that actually 
we change beyond words. That's the fascinating part of it. And we learned it especially with Jesus. Because when he came, he knew all about this already. And he knew also that not only the brain was plastic, but it held in itself this amazing capacity of <coughs> repeating what others do, emulating uh, what others do. It's called the mirror neurons. We all have them. Even animals do. Like, for example, this is like a lab picture. The chimp, the lab researcher showed the tongue, and soon after, he showed the tongue. It's like, you don't need to say words. It's about educating without words. Because that's how they found out we have mirror neurons. We do have, that's why Jesus said, be careful with the people who you are living your life. Because if you think you're living amongst criminals and you're not criminal, you're deceiving yourself. It's impossible to live amongst people who are some way and not be like that. Because we hold the capacity in our brain to imitate naturally what others around us are doing. We are social beings. Let us remember, last week, Leo was talking about the power of being civilization. We we're talking about we being social beings, and we are in our physical body, especially our brain, has this capacity to externalize sometimes exactly what the people whom we live with do. Exactly the same. That's why Emmanuel said, you live with the wisest to learn from them, and if the, with the ones that know less to teach them, and not the reverse. Because when we observe that people are not too wise and we live amongst them, not observing that we need to hold a certain attitude to, to inspire them, and we simply follow through the same pathway, we're doing a disservice to ourselves and to them. That's what Jesus did when he came here. He didn't behave like we did. He was different. That's why we crucified him, because like, too much. Very soon, people were like, I cannot take it anymore. You're too much for us. Because they wanted him to do the same as everybody else. With all of these elements, when we are teaching our children, we're just like this lab researcher. We show the tongue, they show the tongue. They show the tongue back, we cannot say, how come you're doing this? Where did you learn it? In school? And if we had a camera at home, we would find out they learned it at home. It's possible. We, need, we are multipliers today of these teachings of the spirits. When we, we need to share with others out there, so they also empower their lives. And our guide and model, Jesus, he knew of it. He knew he didn't need to write books. Because of this power we hold in our brains, in our minds and in our brains. He knew he didn't need to stay here for a hundred years for us to learn. He came publicly. He stayed for three years publicly, very exposed to the public. At a time, there was no internet, no mass communication, means of mass communication. By his behavior, he changed. Why? Because St. Augustine is going to show us that the master followed through the recipe he had compiled on chapter 14 of the Gospel According to Spiritism. Chapter 14, item 9, if we go through and study it, it's a true recipe for us 
as an educational program that Jesus followed through himself. He did follow through because he was a coherent master. As our guide and model, he was so coherent that he knew if he kept his coherence, people would learn it. Not only that life, that's something that we need to keep in mind. Jesus, our guide and model, is a guide and model for parents, for educators. And when he taught us, he keeps teaching us to date and to immortality. He knew he didn't come for one life only or for only that generation. He came for the future generations as well. And it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. No matter if people say, oh, the Muslims, by 2000 and something, everything is gonna be Muslim. I said, you know, people forget that Muhammad was sent by Jesus as well. All of these prophets and masters were sent by Jesus. So we're talking about the same message. It really doesn't matter the name. What matters is that he's teaching us every day. He knew that all he needed to do was be coherent. What is coherent? Something that Mentor Joseph teaches us. Recently at the Spirit Side of Baltimore, he came to deliver a very short message to all of us, which is something, a recipe for good life. He says, strive to achieve coherence. Align thoughts, feelings with actions and words. Coherence will give you greater peace of mind. Coherence leads us to consistency. That's how Jesus was. Because our children look at us and say, you ask me not to be angry, but I see you angry all the time. And you ask me not to shout or to scream, but that's what you do all the time. You come home and you start saying, people, take a shower, do this, do that. And then tell them, don't scream, don't shout. But that's what you do, mom. That's what you do, dad. So we're not coherent. We're not very congruent. Because we say something, but we do something else. We feel something else and think something else. It's like we're not centered, we're not aligned. Jesus was, because he, when we look at him, he was and he is in his look, his gestures, his posture, his words, his feelings, his vibration. That's why his message is immortal, because it's a message beyond words. So much so that, okay. Andrea Luis explains it by saying, virtue is not a mouth that speaks, but a power that radiates, actually, radiates. Virtue is not a mouth that speaks, but a power that radiates. It's in the book, Christian Agenda, which is here. Andrea Lewis explains to, to us that one of the reasons why Jesus impacts on us across time is because of his virtuous attitude beyond words. With our children, you remember sometimes with our parents or grandparents, one look was enough for him, right? One look, Janet, yeah. Sometimes like one look, no need of words, and you're like you're behaving. Sometimes one, the mother or father would just stand up, the posture would dictate the tone. You didn't need more than that. And we need to learn that there are more ways of educating our children than just words. Because we're gonna found, find out that words have a very limited power. 
according to the absorption capacity of the brain, we absorb much less than what we see. The visual impact is greater. We need to know about this because Jesus was like this. Think of Jesus now. When you think of Jesus, what do you feel? What do you see? Do you see a face? Do you see a whole body? Is it like one word? One scene? One sentence? How do you have an interaction with your guide and model? By the teacher. We need to know to be good educators because he's the master educator. Who is he? When sometimes we are taking a course, we say, oh, my teacher, Woo. what a credentials. The CV is so powerful. That teacher, what about our guiding mode? What do we know of him? We need to know that he held the power of communication. Because communication, we're going to learn, is beyond words. Neuroscience in 2009 in the journal Nature Neuroscience has a beautiful review showing to us that what we show emotionally in our body language impacts more than the words we speak and even facial expression. So when we're teaching our children something, if we rely on words, we're not going too far. No wonder parents repeat many times they say haven't I told you I told you yesterday no I told you last week no I told you the previous month no you haven't learned because we're just saying it what if we combine the power of communication with the other elements so science already shows and this is not up to date because the most recent findings show much more than this but just averaging it out. Our body language is the most powerful means of communication we have amongst ourselves. This, is, this data is prior to this data in 2009 by neuroscience, and we already know that we, what we show in our body language, people pick up much more than we imagine. So our children, whomever is with us, they are reading us beyond their consciousness. They are reading us. We're not even talking about the vibrational field we emit. We're talking about the emotion that we show in our gestures, our posture, our look, our facial expression, the tone of voice. Everything combined is the body language. The tone of voice alone is quite amazing. It holds a capacity of communication that is much more than even words. Knowing of this, we need to refine our communication. So tonight, we're going to learn how Jesus used body language and everything else that encompasses body language to teach beyond words. The words we probably know, the actions. But what we probably don't know, and only spiritism tells, is the body language that was so coherent. It started months ago when Mentor Joseph asked us to do a research. He said, go do research, and we're going to show to you, to all of us, that thanks to spiritism and the refined account of Jesus' passages, we're going to get to know how he educated beyond words. So we're going to go through a few of the nonverbal lessons of Jesus. Something that probably you never heard before. I didn't until actually Mentor Joseph asked us to do this research. Several spiritist books bring the same accounts as in the Bible and they expand. 
because of course the languages in ancient Greece in ancient Hebrew they were not expanded enough to accommodate so many words and not even the thought of humanity at the time could not explain it but now we can so they come through different mediums Chico Xavier in the book Good News Boa Nova through Divaldo Franco with the spirit Amelia Rodriguez Primicias do Reino and we recently found out talking to Divaldo Franco Portuguese uh, authors that are not spiritist and Carlos and I even found out recent authors in the United States who are not spiritist and inspired they say they were inspired they report these passages of Jesus must, must, much like Brother X in this book and Amelia Rodriguez it's the universality of the teachings showing to us that our master keeps teaching us beyond the words it's fascinating we'll see that education becomes much easier if we rely more on these tools than drain ourselves in talking so much if we first rely on our centeredness let us go through how much Jesus actually went through this process we found out that through his facial expression which was tailored to specific situations he spoke more than words through his silence silence is considered by science means of communication silence is something uh, especially the psychotherapy the um, psychoanalysis for example the the new psychoanalysis by uh, Jean-Jacques Lacan and others it talks about the power of the analysis of discourse and the silence in between the sentences they have messages and Jesus did it as well the tone of voice his posture we're gonna find a new master today he smiled he had specific types of smiling at different circumstances it's fascinating and he was a very caring master with his gestures he caressed he consoled and he also hugged people who crossed his pathway he's a very caring master very different from the one sometimes people portray from the bible tonight we're gonna visualize that our master is very reachable he's not far and out there and serious he's a smiling caring loving and very good educator we're gonna find out today by his posture his posture imagine ourselves we go to our children and we tell them don't be sloppy <laughs> but it's funny because they look at us we're seated at the couch and we are very much in a very sloppy position and we're telling them don't be sloppy don't do this be elegant and are we who was this master we talk about him being humble and simple but is it possible to he be humble and at the same time be noble? We're going to see that it's possible. In this most extreme posture of being at service, sometimes if we don't contextualize this passage when he was washing the feet of the disciples, we do not understand what it really meant imagine today if somebody comes here say I'm going to wash let's bring Divaldo Franco here and he's going to wash all of our feet maybe we're gonna behave just like Peter Peter came along he washed the feet of all the disciples and Peter said no master you're not gonna wash mine 
and he turned, and you can read the, the details of the report in this book, he turned to Peter and said, why, Peter, you want to be better than the others? No, Master, it's not fair what you're doing, but I'm going to do it because that's how we learn. The greatest is the one that serves the most. In the posture of being at service, he didn't lack elegance. We're going to learn throughout all the accounts that oftentimes he was portrayed in a very consoling posture. Can, you, can we picture it? A posture that is consoling. Often we can recall it in a nurse, like consoling the posture. Somewhat we cannot even put in words, but Jesus was consoling his posture. He was elegant. Can you believe it? He was noble and simple at the same time. an unforgettable posture and a very charismatic one. Through his own posture, he was teaching us all these things. To go to a party and dress ourselves up in our own posture, in consolation, in charisma, in nobility, in elegance, an elegance that does not hurt others, an elegance that is about self-care. He was like this, and he is like this. One of the passages that we can exemplify is this passage that is in the book Good News, when Brother X tells us about the first time he experienced he exposed himself to the public. He purposely came to the largest Hebrew temple in Jerusalem. It was the first time he was there. To teach us a lesson, he didn't go in. And we'll see why. He stayed outside. He was seated by the stairs and purposely we didn't translate the everything yet because the book's not translated, but I will make sure that I go through the very report of Brother X. Let us picture this. He goes there and seated as a pilgrim. This is quite interesting. Picture this, seated as a pilgrim. How can you portray it? Jesus was noticed by a group of ministers who felt attracted to his traces of elegant on originality and by his lucid and deep look. Let us picture this educator of ours. He was there seated like somebody who didn't come to stay. You could tell he was coming from another city. He was coming from another area, but he had an elegance, a deep look, very lucid look. And then one of the ministers came to him and asked with a lot of pride, Galilee, what do you do in the city? And Christ exclaimed with noble modesty noble modesty. So to be modest sometimes is not enough. We need to be noble in our modesty. I pass through Jerusalem searching for the foundation of the kingdom of God. That's why he didn't enter the temple. Because if he had this conversation inside the temple, he was going to think that he meant the kingdom of God inside of a temple. And it's not in the temple. In any temple we're going to find, not even inside of a spiritual center. Why? We may ask the very question that the minister 
With certain irony, he replied, Kingdom of God? And who do you think you are? What do you think it is? And he said, with great serenity. This is important for us when we read these books, that we observe the qualities. He didn't reply with sarcasm. He didn't reply with uh, arrogance. He didn't reply with pride. He replied with serenity. This is not in the Bible. Why? Because they didn't have time to report it back then. Now we do. The spirits come, bring the message, and they compliment, saying, that's the way he replied. The communication that impacted his serenity. And he says, the kingdom of God is the divine work in the heart of each person. Us. Not in the temple. Not in the church, not in the spiritual thing. We come here to find this in our hearts. Because as Mother Teresa says, it doesn't matter. People talk this or that or the other. When life ends, it's going to be between us and God. And we cannot tell God, oh God, I killed this person because this person stole my car. Oh, really? Because he made a mistake, you made a worse mistake. There's no excuse. He made a mistake, period. But you made a worse mistake, or the same. There's no excuse. What others do is their problem. What we do is our problem. That's why the kingdom of God is inside of us. We need to teach our children. It doesn't matter what people do to you. It matters what you do to people. Empowering them in spirit is never to fall into the victim position. Never. When somebody comes and does something to them, we need to sit them down and say, what have you done to attract this into your life? But mom, this guy was bullying me. Okay, he's wrong. We're going to pray for him. But what are you doing to attract that in your life? Is it a previous life pattern? What was in your mind before he started bullying you? Were you thinking positive? Because if we don't empower our children to be responsible for what happens in their lives, we're teaching them to be simple victims of others. And the life of a victim is not a life at all. And that's what Jesus came to us, say to us. What people do is their problem. Oh, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Telling, I am not going to make a mistake because they're doing a mistake. In Jesus' case, as the spirits say, he's the only one that came here not to pay anything. We're here to learn a lot, to pay some debts. We could use other words, redress mistakes, learn to make wiser choices. But whatever happens in our lives, we're not victims. We need to fall into our responsibility. Not even the parents we chose is by chance. And Jesus, in his attitude, he showed the power of communication beyond words, education. He taught us with his look. Can you picture his look? Let me give you the, some of the qualities of the several passages in these books that these spirits reported. And then let us see how we easily we can recognize his educational tools through his look. His look was sometimes firm. Other circumstances, loving. Lucid, attentive, soft, bright. These are the major 
adjectives and qualities that the spirits gave to the several circumstances in which he radiated a look that had a specific message. When you portray Jesus' look, how do you see his look? If it is a punishing look, an angry look, it is not Jesus. He never in a million years at his level would radiate this type of look. Emit. So if that Jesus we have inside of us is that far-reaching Jesus, cold look is not Jesus. This is the Jesus. And just sharing amongst us, I was trying to portray, because it's very difficult. Personally, it was very difficult for me to try to portray all these qualities. And I was like, oh, what is the closest that I get? Some people that I know, I could get like a tiny resemblance of some of these qualities. And I'll share this with us just to give us a boost. Because Jesus sent them to teach us so we get closer to Jesus as well. For example, Godin. I'll never forget his look. It is a firm look. And at the same time, very attentive. He has some form of brightness. It is deep. At the same time, very loving and lucid. Some form, like Divaldo Franco's look, when you look in his eyes, it is deep. The people whom we held greater relationship, it's likely that we all have people in our lives that would be a good example of some of these qualities. What if we try to practice them so when we educate our children, they can feel these things through our eyes. When we tell them they come and we're busy at the computer. Not now. We don't even know if it's important. What about if we turn, look at them, stare at them? Sometimes a very <coughs> loving and firm stare is going to do it all. They're going to look. I've seen children. You look at them when they request something, and they say, oh, no, 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 no nothing, nothing. I just changed my mind. It's OK. You don't need to say a word. But we need to be coherent and composed to go and use it as means of communication as well. It's very beautiful because in a passage, when Jesus was exemplifying this, several passages, it shows that Jesus was teaching with the way he looked to confirm, to reinforce between him and the disciples and the people. Beyond the words he said, he taught more with his nonverbal lessons than he does. And these lessons probably are not going to create dissension amongst people because it's about feeling. It's not about reasoning. Oh, but he said this word. Oh, but this word doesn't mean this. It means that. And then people disagree. They form different churches. But about this, there's no way not to agree that a coherent master has all these qualities. And he is there calling recruiting the disciples. He recruited Peter already, and he's passing by the lake of Galilee. And he got closer to two young people, John, the future John the Evangelist, and James. So he got along and said, sons of Zebedee, the father, kindly he said it. Not the way I'm saying. Of course, it's probably a different way. I don't know how. But kindly, he said, sons of Zebedee, 
Would you like to partake in the joys of the good news? And James and John, who knew about the preaching of John the Baptist, that were already announcing the Messiah, and heard in the previous night, they were filled with joy and they said, Oh, Master, oh, Master. They were happy. They came along and hugged Jesus. It's a different master. How often we do this with our children? Sometimes in the busyness of life, we're caught up in so much tension. And this master was not tense. He was recruiting to the good news with this kindness. And you know the most fascinating part? is what Brother X reports here. That they said that they sat down to talk to him and John took the hands of Jesus and kissed them to show reverence, but kissed with affection. And what Jesus, did Jesus do in turn? He caressed the curls of the hair of John. And this is not about homosexuality or anything. Nothing against it, but nothing to report it either. It's, it's about caring. Can you imagine, picture this. This master, you kiss the hand, he's reachable. He's not this master that you're like, oh, I cannot reach, cannot touch, cannot be, like I have to be like frozen of fear that the master is going to say something bad about me. No, it's such a loving and all-embracing master that he sits down, he allows his hands to be caressed and kissed, and he returns caressing the hair of John with affection. <laughs> That's a good thing for us, to bring Jesus closer to us at home and say, Master, can you please caress my hair as well? Why not? If he did it back then when he was incarnated, imagine now that he doesn't have a body to hold him. He can be anywhere. But he educated John with his love. And they say John was the beloved disciple and probably the most evolved. He reincarnated as St. Francis and really made a difference in all of our lives because with him we were recalling once again the need to go through that pathway. He not only taught with his look but with his silence. Do we think about Jesus as a chatterbox? Like Somebody who comes and says, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. He was not like this. He was a master so well composed. When you see the reports, often Brother X, Amelia Rodriguez, and others report that the, the, he was amongst the people. They were discussing arguing sometimes, and he was not mingling there at the time. He was near, but not there. In this blah, 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 I think this way, that way. For example, John and James thought they would be the great disseminators because they were young. And Peter was hurt because he felt he was too old to be the disseminator. And Jesus, in one of the chapters here, Brother X reports, had to resolve it. But he didn't go into the fuss that they were doing about it. They, he awaited the right time. And in the book, Jesus in the Home, we often see the reports that when he was talking to the people, he would use silence to give them time to think. We need to do this with our children. Look at them in the eyes, talk to them, give pauses. Not say, you need to do this, 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 and that, okay? Okay, go to your bedroom. 
if we gave one pause in between, maybe we would give them an opportunity with us to chew upon the teachings and then go through it. So we learned throughout the reports that Jesus used silence for two main things. One, to reflect, meditate. Every day he had his time off to meditate without anybody. Do we do it? Because he needed to calibrate himself into the heaviness of this body. How often do we do it? Maybe never? So we're not going to be calibrated. So he meditated to compose, to be one with himself, and also silence to avoid confrontation, not because he was afraid or he was consenting, but because he would also think before replying, he never reacted, and always making a pause to give people time to chew upon the, the teachings. There lies also a message. We're going to see the different reports. He gave people time to think. For example, when he was with the disciples for the first time, he got them all together and started saying, I came here, my beloved ones, so you do this, that, the other, da da da. Then he gave a pause. At the very pause he gave, Judas started speaking. Very interesting for the first time. And, G and Judas said, Master, your plans are fair and precious. Sometimes we have a child just like this. We plan things out, and then they raise their hands and say, well, this is very well aligned, but you know, what about this? It happened to Jesus as well. That rebellious child was Judas. And he said, well, we can do it all, but we cannot edify this plan without financial contribution. What did Jesus do? something quite interesting. Silently, he contemplated Judas with serenity. He didn't say, he went right there and boom, whipped Judas. That's what we do, but he did. He contemplated, meaning he looked Contemplate means take time, silently. So he used silence to avoid confrontation, to be one, and to show serenity as well. And he said, well, Judas, did God need the wealth of the world to build the beauty of the world? Did God need money to build the trees? and the flowers, etc. Money, when is used by hands that know how to manage it, it's a very useful instrument. But it's never going to be everything, because above the perishable treasures of the earth is the love, is love in its infinite resources. Judas was not satisfied. Jesus gave a pause, again, silence, and continued. Nevertheless, Judas, even though I don't have the money of the world, I cannot disregard of the contribution of people who would like to partake into the kingdom of my father in the spirit of the individuals. Put in practice your proposal, but be careful with temptation of material things. Organize your bag of cooperation and keep it with you, but does never 
surpass the limit. Quite interesting. Jidas was not satisfied and he kept saying, okay, I'm going to start collecting tonight. And he started collecting from the disciples. And Jesus let it happen. At the end, Jesus stared at him serenely and prophetically replied, Yes, Judas, the bag of money that you have is small, but may God allow that you never succumb to its weight. Prophetically. Sometimes we look at our child and we see the tendencies. Sometimes it's going to be there for us to go through with them our whole lives. We need to be patient, but we need to teach them anyways. Never give up. And sometimes teaching like he did, because he taught it so well that in that very life, Judas learned a lesson. It didn't take more than that life for him to really wake up. Why? Because the, the teaching was there. He didn't learn as fast as the others, but he learned in a very difficult way, but he did with his silence. So let us temper our communication with this wisdom of the silence, not the silence that hurts, because sometimes our children or the people in our lives, they want a word and we don't say anything. It's the silence to meditate and to avoid confrontation. In all these passages, I was quite amazed. Jesus never turned down any request. He never said, no, no, too busy. Now I'm here. All the time we see them reporting that he was there meditating Somebody came to him and asked him a question or made a request. He was there. He never turned anybody down saying they're too busy. That's fascinating. Though he kept himself in his centeredness, whenever requested, he served. With his look, with his gesture, with his posture, because a virtue is not a mouth that speaks but a power that radiates. And the beauty comes now with his smile. It's one of the best parts, quite surprising. And it's so hard to find a picture of Jesus smiling in the internet. If you find one, send it to me, please. Because all the ones I find, they're not coherent. They are like very vulgar. I often repeat this like Jesus. I'm like, what is this? It's not like the way they report. Jesus was not like that. He was the one that smiled, but his smile was composed. And probably this is the only picture that resembles to something of what the spirits something. I'm not saying everything because I don't know, but of what they describe. It's a picture of the movie Passion of the Christ. Besides that craziness about the, the bloody part, if you pass that part and go through the beautiful passages of his childhood, his family life, and then with the disciples, it's so precious. It seems like the person who puts the script together knew of the reports of the spirits. Even in this scene, it's quite surprising. I was watching it again, and it's quite like what they describe here. Jesus was a smiling do uh, master. He was funny. He had a sense of humor. And here, he was a carpenter building like a table different for the people at the time, already portraying what will be in the future. And the mother was quite puzzled. Just like they say here, the mother couldn't quite keep up with his visionary mind. But he was very kind and soothing to the mind of the mud. And here we see a smile. The smile, he was always smiling. It's unbelievable. In this research, the most amazing part is how much he smiled. He didn't 
laugh as people think like vulgarly. But he was smiling. And his smile, portrayed by the spirits through the medium, Chico Xavier and Valdo Franco, reported different things at different moments. He had smiles of serenity. Can you imagine a serene smile? A benign smile. A benign smile. A smile that makes you feel good. A benign, a good smile. Loving smile. Calm smile. A generous smile. An elegant smile. A sincere smile and a friendly smile. It's fascinating. When he comes in one of the beautiful passages, when he's talking to Bartholomew, Bartholomew is this, we would say in modern words, depressed disciple. He's really like so concerned about the problems of the world. He loved Jesus. He loved the message. But he came to Jesus and Master. I don't know how to explain to you about my inner sadness. Your message, the gospel, really brings me a lot of hope. You talk about this kingdom that is not of this world, and I see so many sadness and crime around me. It's so sad. I'm so depressed, as if he said in current times, depressed. Of course, at the time, he didn't have the, the word. And Jesus sent this look of calmness and talked with serenity. Bartolomeo, however, these teachings of the good news, they are the ones that bring good news. Have you heard of good news that do not produce joy? So to all of us who are sad, distraught in the heart, this is what we need to think. He serenely addresses by saying, that we should keep our good heart open up, cheer up, because he says the message is something that becomes a trademark of all the followers by being always hopeful, joyful, and faithful, and courageous. He talks to Bartholomew with pauses, and smiles. At the end, Jesus stops and remains in silence. The look he had in his eyes had a different brightness. When Bartholomew looked at Jesus' eyes, he got it. He went home. His brothers didn't understand him. He often said, you're a crazy man. You follow this crazy carpenter. What is this? It's like people telling about spiritism today. What is this crazy doctrine? Talks with the spirits, the dead, blah, blah, blah. He went home and for the first time, the brothers came to him and said bad things and cursed him and he didn't react. He didn't reply. He didn't feel the need to explain anything and say, no, you have to understand it. Here you go. Read this. Here's how it, how it goes. He didn't. He did what Jesus do. He didn't say a word for the first time. He didn't lose his peace. And when he met Jesus, Jesus looked at him with this kind eyes, very generous, smile at him, in the smile, the benign smile, loving smile. And with that smile, Bartholomew felt that never again he would fall in sadness. It's fascinating. When we read the chapter, it's quite amazing the way he educated the disciples beyond the words with his smile throughout the several passages. He used to smile to people. And the highlight here 
which is the top. It's like the cherry of these non-verbal lessons is his embrace. It's just to picture the master giving us a hug. He gave a hug to everybody. And not only to the disciples. He not only came to the father of John and James when he knelt down and said, my child, my children are yours. And he said, stand up because Zebedee, the fight in the kingdom of God, we need to stand up and face it. And he hugged Zebedee and caressed his head, man to man. He also hugged Zacchaeus. When he was at the tree, Jesus passed by and said, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to visit your home. The disciples were mad. He's like, what is this? This master is crazy. This man, he's not a religious man. He's a man that really takes money from people who really don't have much money. And you know what happens? The reports say that when he climbed down from the tree, he hugged Jesus. And Jesus replied, giving his arm to Zacchaeus and walked to his house. The disciples were falling in the crowd. And Jesus was quiet and listening. To other people, he was going mad. What is this giving attention to this man? He came to the home and ate the food and listened to Zacchaeus telling all the stories. And at the very end, when Zacchaeus really woke up and said, Master, today is a different day. And he says, I'm going to give back and the double to everybody whom I stole, whom I got the money. And he says, blessed are you, for today's salvation is in this home. Of course, there, when we learn from the scholars, he was saying salvation, he meant it was very um, um, ambiguous in the sense that his name, Joshua, meant salvation. And salvation was used the same word. So it's almost like because of the words he was using. But besides that point, at the very end, no matter what people were thinking, even the disciples who couldn't understand the depth of the message he was sharing there, he hugged Zacchaeus. He hugged him, a hug of friendship, of support, saying, you can do it. I'm here to support you. How often we do this with our children? We hug them to support them. We hug them. Even science shows that when we caress, we're releasing endorphins, and this calms people down, even animals. Like caressing, how much do we do this? We don't need more than sometimes the hand or sometimes a hug to go and exemplify these nonverbal lessons. They say that his embrace was tender, was loving, and was meek. It was not this arrogant embrace of power. Never. Because you see, a hug can mean many things, right? This hug was tender, was meek, was humble, was mild, well-tempered. It's probably like halfway through the Brazilian hug. <laughs> Not so much, because sometimes it's too much feast there. This hug was very tender, very loving, and meek. And let us not forget that he said, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Meek are those who do not react. So now, to wrap it up, we're going to picture ourselves receiving his embrace. 
he was an all-embracing master. We need to bring this guiding mother closer to us, especially when we're suffering, and feel this hug. He can hug us now as we did before and feel this tenderness, his weakness, his love, and how he educates us as we can get inspired to educate our children through a hug, through an embrace. It is possible. We're going to stop now to do a short visualization for us to step into this level, this dimension. So we can do this every day if possible, at least once a day. We sit down and visualize us being hugged. No wonder Joana de Angelis brought to us in this CD, Saúde in Portuguese, and Health in English, that talks about a visualization encounter with Jesus and at the end he hugs. Because he was like that, embracing master, embracing educator. Sometimes when we don't know how else to change and transform ourselves like Saul did, let us receive his hug. Probably in the hug, we're going to get the power and strength that we need to boost us to another level of transformation. Because the brain holds the power to consolidate the transformation, the very spiritual brain that is animated by the mind and the physical brain. We ready? Let us please turn off the lights and that's going to prepare us for the passes.